Probably um, it's very easy for me to remember the McGill Summer School because um, it's probably one of those unique Friday mornings. Um, I was very good last night, left the bar early, got up to bed, and I was fortunate enough to be up in the Blue Stack Mountains at 6 o'clock this morning having a walk, and uh, it's truly spectacular country here. So very privileged for, for everyone here. I've been fortunate in my career to date to have gone through an, you know, a number of phases, so originally working with Board Mona, uh, semi-state company uh, exploiting the peat resources of Ireland, then going through a start-up phase of a renewable business called uh, uh, Airtricity, and more recently, uh, um, I suppose, working for uh, you know, a large integrated utility, which is GB-based. So I've been fortunate to have a variety of experiences in the energy field. I've also been fortunate to be able to have looked at a number of energy markets all around the world. And it's probably kicked a keen interest to me in, in trying to understand the trends that are going around globally. So I'm going to take a slightly different approach from Porig in that I'm going to start with a, a kind of an overview of what, what's happened historically in the world over the last 20 years. So that's what this graph is trying to, to communicate to people. We basically have uh, uh, the gross demand for energy all across the world, measured in millions of tons of oil equivalent, which is a way of bringing all energy sources to one common fuel denomination. And I've put just a couple of the, the areas here. The red area is the United States, the blue area is actually the EU, the green area is China, and I suppose the, uh, or, I wouldn't call it orange, probably the, what would you call it? Mustard, yes. Mustard areas the rest of the world. Now, there's a couple of things that, that once you start to try and, and look at this and try and internalize this, you know, that strikes me very, very strongly. If you take uh, the United States and the EU, and we have this image that, you know, the United States is very profligate with energy, hasn't done a really a lot in terms of being more economic about how it uses energy. The facts would slightly belie that. You know, it, there's a li been a little bit of a crease in the United States, but more or less energy has been flat. Energy consumption measured at a gross level has been flat in the United States. And that's very true in, in, uh, in Europe as well, in the EU. I mean, the key band here, and I've just put one of the countries in, which is China, which is the green band, and that tells you really what's going on in the world over the last 20 years. As economies like China and India are raising their population out of poverty, giving them real livelihoods, and enhancing their capability to have, I suppose, a more meaningful life, these people are consuming more energy. And in essence, what's happening around the world is you know, the developing countries are taking their fair share of the um, fuel resources of the world. And that's principally what's driving demand all around the world. What are the consequences of this? Well, very interesting, again, if you take two kind of key vectors. You go from 1998 to 1998, total global energy consumption grew by about 13%. And the 10 years from 1998 to 2008, it grew by 26%. So again, if you take a view of the world and the peril that the planet is in, in terms of energy consumption, we're actually on a, a, a rapidly increasing curve of energy consumption all around the world. And this is not good news. It's not good news for us in the room here, and it's not good news for the people who are going to come after us on the planet. And why is that? This slide tries to explain where the growth in energy is coming from. And just to, to kind of talk a little bit about this, to try and give a flavor, again, we've brought everything to the same common denomination, coal, oil, gas, nuclear, and hydro, and just looked at the last 10 years. And the key messages here is that actually, if you think about, you know, we in the West have a perception, well, we've started the renewables gig, and we're, we're starting to get and make a little bit of progress on that. But if you actually step back and think about what's happened in the world, this has been the most successful 10 years for coal in terms of its market share in the world economy ever. So at a time when we're trying to actually you know, deal with carbon, we've actually accelerated the deployment and consumption of coal right around the world. Principally, I have to say, in the actual emerging economies of India and China. And you know, again, what's the right for us in the West to turn around to those people and say they can't exploit those resources? When it's raising people out of poverty and giving them, you know, uh, you know starting to put you know, a basic living standard behind the bulk of the population, it's a very difficult issue to deal with. But what are the consequences? The consequences are that, that we haven't actually started to grapple with the issue of, of CO2 emissions. 
as a world. You know, we're on a star, a curve that's upward going. This is actually taken uh, from the observatory in, in Hawaii, and it just measures the parts per million. It's factual. It's the parts per million measured every year at this observatory in Hawaii year on year. And again, we're on an upward curve. I think, you know, we as a planet and we as a people face a huge challenge in dealing with this issue. How do we decarbonize our economies? And how do we in the West take the lead in decarbonizing our economies? So I think that's actually the fundamental context in which the energy debate in Ireland has to take place. And what are the two key messages I would relate to you here? Fossil fuel prices, we used to have this image, will be set by what the people in the cartel, such as OPEC, demand in terms of the oil. That's not the case. Fossil fuel prices will be set by countries like India and China, what they determine to pay for fossil fuels. And to be quite honest, they are currently demonstrating an ability to outcompete the West when it comes to pricing and taking international fuel into their economy and converting it into goods which we rebuy in the West. So we have virtually no control in the West in my opinion, as to the future prices of fossil fuels. It's largely going to be an offshoot of what the Chinese energy policy is and what the Indian energy policy is. The second issue, CO2. We have a much bigger problem now than we had 10 years ago, and we're on a trajectory that's unsustainable as a planet. And this will become the biggest single economic opportunity facing the world over the next 20, 30 years. There's going to be lots of wealth created in dealing with this major problem. Just to put it in context in the European market, I, I put up a couple of slides, and again, what I'm trying to show here is what we've done in, in, in basically the EU, the 27 EU countries, and more or less, we've made progress in reducing the amount of coal consumption here in the EU, increasing gas, you know, uh, nuclear is more or less flat in the EU, 27 in the last 10 years, and hydro is, the hydro reason it's, it's slight variation is due to the year, yearly variation you get in hydro, not due to um, you know, reduction in installed capacity. But in essence, that's the context in which we in Ireland operate in, if you like, the next envelope down from the world. We operate in the EU economy. And what about the Irish fuel mix? Well, the Irish fuel mix is predominantly fossil fuel. Um, we have, you know, Porig mentioned it, we have a huge dependency on fossil fuel. You know, over the last period of time, we've seen rapid growth in oil and gas consumption. I think our demand for uh, energy at a time when the EU has been virtually flat or plus 2%, I think, in the last 10 years, our gross energy demand as a country is up 27%. So, again, you know, what have we done with the economic boom in the last 10 years? We certainly consumed a lot more energy than we were consuming 10 years ago. It's questionable whether we've actually done anything to shift the economy to a more sustainable front on that particular issue, whether we've changed the generation mix. So that's really what I'm saying to you here. What's the key outcomes for the, for the Irish economy in terms of energy? We live in a world where fossil fuel prices are way beyond our control to influence what we're going to buy at. And we live in a world that the fundamental big economic issue of the next 30 years is how we go about decarbonizing the current economic systems of the world. For us, in a, an econ economic system where we're 91% deported on, on uh, imported fossil fuels, this is not a great starting point. And it gets even worse when you start to consider how exposed we are to carbon as an economy. We're the second most polluting country in the EU 27, I think, after Luxembourg. We're 50% more polluting in terms of CO2 per capita than the EU average and around, I think, 55% more polluting uh, per capita than our neighbours in GB. So as you face into a world where you have no control of fossil fuel prices, and you face into a world where decarbonising actually your economy is going to be the key, uh, you know, one of the key economic measures of how you, how you progress as an economy, we're not starting from a great place. I think the other thing about, I would make about the Irish marketplace is, is one of scale. You know, it, it's, it's a marketplace that in many instances is subscale. And what do I mean by that? There's probably more economic ways of converting energy, if you even take power plants, and building them at larger scale and larger markets than you could countenance in the Irish marketplace. Because 
of its limited scale potential. And that's certainly one of the issues that I think we're going to have to grapple with over the next um, 10 years. So I know Pori put up some prices about uh, slides. I've actually taken this from an SEI presentation that I was at last week. And it's EU electricity prices for the second semester in 2008. And it's based on uh, industrial customers, I think, band two, to be precise. And what the graph here is trying to show, well, you know, it would be a miracle if we had low energy prices in Ireland. And if you look internationally within the EU27, well, what do you find? Well, you find in this current measure, and it's, again, same with Pork was, large industrial consumers, it's ourselves and the Italians, right, who are in the most uh, um, costly energy band. And again, it's driven by all of the issues that Pori touched on. Overdependence on fossil fuels, little renewable energy, no exposure to uh, nuclear energy. And we've also had another issue, which is we've had to invest hugely to meet up with the huge spurt in growth um, that was within the Irish economy and the huge demand so even though, say, in Ireland, gross energy grew by 27% in the last 10 years, the electricity space actually grew at something like 42%. So there's a lot of new investment had to go in to the electricity marketplace to meet that demand. And as a result, we have, uh, certainly for industrial customers, some of the highest electricity prices in the EU27. No, the, the, the best would be the green and the blue. So, yeah, France would actually be there along with the Scandinavian countries. So, you know, if you take here, very careful now, don't fall off the platform. France is basically a nuclear driven uh, energy system. So, it's taking the benefit of, of uh, basically relatively low nuclear uh, cost relative to a period of high fossil fuels. And the other country to notice is the Scandinavian area, which is probably next in line. And that's principally driven out of uh, renewables, principally hydro, historical hydro plants up there. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got to, to, to actually recognize where we're starting from and then how do we change this? I'd make three points in terms of the debate about energy in the Irish economy going forward. I would say as, as policy advisors, the first thing we need to focus on is the electricity sector within the Irish economy in terms of the overall energy space in Ireland. And why is that? You know, the electricity system in itself is just a means of converting one form of energy into another form of energy. And it's a distribution network, basically, for energy. And if you look again around the world, what's happened is that the general tendency as economies get smarter, better, uh, people get wealthier, industries um, get more sophisticated. There's a movement up the food chain from basic energy to electricity, which is basically a higher form, a processed form of energy, which can either give you heat, can give you power, uh, it can even deal with some transport issues. At the center of a decarbonized economy, you will have the electricity distribution system. I mean, there's, you know, I can see no other way of actually fundamentally dealing with the carbon issue other than hanging most of our needs for transport, most of our needs for heat, out of a decarbonized electricity system where the distribution network becomes the heartbeat of the Irish economy. So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of the getting it right in terms of the infrastructure within the Irish economy in terms of electricity. It's much more important because it's actually building the central nervous system for the successful economy of the next century. The second thing is, is, is like, again, reiterating Porrick's point, like we, we've only scratched the surface in dealing with the renewable capacity issue. We have to do quantum shifts from where we are at the moment to actually make an indent in decarbonizing the Irish economy and build, you know, at a huge scale, the renewable capacity that's available. And I think the other thing we have to actually start to look at, one of the relative successes in economic policy, I think, in the last you know, three, four years, has been the creation of a single electricity market north and south at a wholesale level. And I, I think one of the ways we have to actually deal with the Irish energy situa situation in the electricity market is actually deal with it in the context of a regional electricity market solution for part of northwestern Europe. And that logically for us starts with doing a deal with uh, our neighbor, uh, Great Britain, and finding ways to both lower costs and lower the cost of delivering this decarbonized economy of the future. Similar to what was done in SEM, 
Both sides in the SEM, the Northern Ireland economy and the Irish economy, benefited from actually increasing the scale on the island of Ireland. The next logical thing to do is actually increase the scale uh, of an Ireland GB regional electricity market. I've dealt with that already, that, that electricity is really the key to the future smart energy economy. And, you know, investments actually in energy infrastructure and electricity space may take some time to, uh, you know, yield benefit, but it's absolutely the smartest thing we can be doing at the moment is, if you like, I would say even over-investing in the wires networks that are required to be the, you know, the nervous system of the uh, energy network for Ireland of the future. When did we talked about before, it's, it's quite simply this, why, why is it going to happen? And, you know, it's basically the resource. We are blessed here in Ireland with one of the best wind resources in, in northwestern Europe. So, you know, we are an ideal centre of excellence for production of low carbon electricity based around wind. And I think that's one of the key areas where we do have a competitive advantage. Speaking as a person who builds wind plants, you know, in a number of jurisdictions historically and at the moment I'm actively building plants in GB and in Ireland, there's no doubt I can build and deliver lower kilowatt hour prices out of plants built in Ireland than I can build in GB at the moment. And there's a variety of reasons behind that, but one of the fundamental reasons is I can capture more energy for every unit of investment I put in in Ireland than I can in GB because of certain constraints to do with land usage. And that principally is down to population densities between both countries. We live in an island of 6 million people. GB is an island of, of you know, circa 60 million people. There's a lot more people in the land mass, so it's a lot more difficult to get effective use of the land mass for something like wind energy. But it's one of the few areas where we do have a competitive advantage in terms of energy production. I suppose the key message I wanted to engender is a debate around this particular issue, which is like, how do you deal with this issue of, of you know, immediate cost issues in the short term while building you know, a, a low carbon economy that's going to meet the challenges of the next century, or this century, I should say. And I think one of the fundamental ways we have to do is, is, is switch our benchmarking of performance within the Irish economy to our next door neighbor. So one of the things I think we need to set as an absolute number one priority in terms of energy policy within the electricity space is why can't we have the same wholesale price in Ireland as in GB? Is that physically impossible? Do we lose energy in transmitting it across and it's, it's physically not possible to do? I think that's one of the areas where I would start to actually try and lower our cost base versus our most immediate competitive neighbour for the bulk of Irish indigenous industry, which is GB. And we should try and set a political objective of at least getting to a point where energy for electricity costs the same in GB in Ireland. And I think there's going to be fundamental trade-offs here. Can we get GB to pay for some of the infrastructure that we have to put in in return for giving them access to low-cost renewable energy that's produced here in Ireland? Can we trade some of our long-term offshore wind resources to GB to meet the demand of a much larger population in return for investment in infrastructure in the Irish marketplace. It's almost like you have to design a new treaty between Ireland and GB to deal with the energy markets. I think there is a short-term gain here, but also there's a long-term gain. Because if you look at the scale of the issue that's facing us in terms of decarbonizing um, our economies, the scales of investment are like nothing that has been seen before in the electricity space. And I'll, I'll talk about two specific examples that, that I'm involved in at the moment. Uh, we're building a, an offshore wind park at the moment in a, a place called Greater Gabbard, which is about 25 miles off the Thames estuary, uh, off London. And the capital investment in that is 1.5 billion in a new power generating plant. And that probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people in the room because, you know, you know, what does that actually mean in conceptual terms? That's actually the biggest single investment in generation that has taken place in GB since the last nuclear plant was built. Right? So the scale of investments that are coming down the track to actually decarbonize our economy are of vast scale. We're currently designing and thinking and strategizing about what we do as we lower our costs from a learning curve in offshore wind 
and trying to conceptualize, well, what are likely to be the big uh, projects that will get delivered in 10, 15 years' time? And we're currently working with a number of other international partners, um, um, RWE, Statoil Hydro, Statcraft, designing a, a wind park in the North Sea uh, around the Dogger Bank, which would have the capacity to deliver um, approximately twice the total electricity demand of the Republic of Ireland. So, you know, between 55, around 55 terawatt hours. The capital investment in that will be of an order of magnitude that, you know, is only really, you know, uh, got by thinking about the whole nuclear bill program in GB. We're talking about investments of the order of 30, 35 billion uh, euros uh, to actually deliver that generation capacity. So what, why am I telling you this? Because I think actually to actually deal with some of these issues, it will be about finding alliances both with governments and between um, you know, power companies who actually can do stuff together that no one single company can do. And I think that's the future that we actually see is one fundamentally based around you know, uh, open markets where we have, uh, if you like, uh, fair uh, access uh, relatively harmonious prices, but actually dealing with some of the issues along with our neighbours uh, to actually decarbonise the economy. And I think that's the big fundamental challenge um, that I would put to the audience today is, you know, if you like, the idea I'd like you to take away is that, you know, we should start by now seeing whether we can actually do uh, a new uh, relationship in the area of electricity and energy with our next door neighbour, GB and see can we actually deal with the long-term, the short-term and long-term cost issues. Thank you.